And so having been on uh, Charlie's uh, LinkedIn course, it's uh, um, the other uh, week, it was just interesting, last week, it was interesting to think about, right, what are the things that matter? So when we're looking at our profiles, we're looking at uh, all the different issues. And Charlie quite rightly sort of put, put it all into context with her otter and said, right, okay, what are, what are we actually trying to achieve? Where does LinkedIn fit into what we're trying to achieve? And it's the same with profit, because what we do is we get trapped into um, thinking um, the, totally the wrong way. So what I try and do is just use a few stories uh, to illustrate and just a few, there's so much we could talk about, but in our time together, we just uh, talk a few stories that will hopefully illustrate the points and uh, look at some sort of more factual issues, but rather than sort of going through accounts in detail, we'll just uh, go through stuff that will op hopefully open the filing cabinets in our head and say, does that apply to me? Love it. So okay. in terms of questions and answers, Mike, do you have a preference around how people ask questions? No, you uh, can cut in at any time and uh, I will tr do my best to watch the chat, but if I, if I rabbit on and uh, haven't uh, paid attention to it, just uh, butt in Charlie and just draw my attention to it. Brilliant. So for everybody watching, the chat is where you hang out. Um, if you do have any questions um, at any point during this um, workshop, then put it in the chat and then Mike will be able to monitor that and I'll monitor it as well. And that, you know, if you want to discuss anything in a bit more of a meaty way, then um, hang fire until the end and we'll do a bit of a Q&A at the end as well. Sound good? Okay. Brilliant. I'm going to turn my screen off so you're not distracted by me and I'm also going to write some notes. So, uh, over to you. Okay, so uh, apologies for my um, casual attire, as it were. I'm in uh, sunny, well, meant to be sunny Dartmouth, but it was lovely and sunny last night, and it, it's chucking it down with rain today. So I've interrupted a week away with my wife uh, to uh, share these few ideas with you. So uh, hopefully they'll they'll be entertaining. Um, hopefully they'll be challenging and give you some thought process. So. Although I'm an accountant, um, this is not about being an accountant. This is all about being a businessman um, and the experience I've picked up over the years all over the world when I uh, talk about profit and advise about profit. So let me start by taking you on holiday with me. So we're going to Barbados and uh, this is Stephen said he's just been watching, uh, watching the video of uh, our friend in Barbados. But... I was staying in a hotel, not at the Sandy Lane Hotel, which is notorious for its pink uh, um, sunbeds and pink umbrellas. Where This is where the stars go. You can't walk off the beach into the Sandy Lane Hotel unless you are somebody staying there. So I was walking along and uh, Gary Lineker wasn't there. So I was, had my sunglasses. I was there, but I was looking through the side there and I think, ah, oh, maybe David Beckham's there. Rihanna, Rihanna, you know, lives in Barbados. Is she there? But no, nobody was there that uh, I was expecting to see. But one person was there who I wasn't expecting to see. He said, hi. He said, welcome to Barbados. He said, you're new here. When did you get in? Well, we got in last night. I thought so. He said, I hadn't seen you before. I walk these beaches every day and I, I get to know the people who are on here. So he said, let me give you a friendly word of warning. He said, although it's five o'clock in the evening and here's our friend here in his England football shirt and uh, um, England cap. He says, uh, five o'clock in the evening and it's still sunny. And he says, I've seen so many people ruin their holidays just because they've actually not been careful and they've not worn a shirt and uh, covered their skin because it, this heat is really very hot. And he said, one more thing. He says, if you carry on walking on the beach, he says, these leaves over here, if those leaves were to fall on your skin, they're acidic. And I've seen holidays ruined simply because people are not uh, careful enough and they don't, uh, they're not aware of the power of these leaves. So he didn't try and sell us anything. It's really quite strange. And uh, just tried to befriend us and give us a warning. So Adrian, um, one of our friends there said, and uh, what have you got in your bag? I said, Adrian, you never ever ask a salesman what they're trying to sell. And she, he says, oh, well, madam, that's for you, uh, for me to know and you'd find out. She says, what are you trying to sell? I said, Adrian, never ask a salesman what you're trying to sell. And he just burst out laughing. He says, madam, I don't sell anything. He says, people buy pineapples from me. And I thought, smart, clever guy. Anyway, we weren't interested in uh, buying a pineapple uh, that time of evening. We just wanted to walk along the beach, stretch our legs. And uh, he's, we said goodbye and he didn't try and sell us a thing. Next day, we were walking uh, along the same stretch of the beach and uh, he called us, he said, hi, he said, do you have a good night? Uh, did I warn you about those leaves? Yeah, absolutely. 
And then my wife here said to me, said to him, said, what's your name? He says, my name is Original, rolling his R. I'm the original pineapple man from Barbados. And I thought, that's fantastic. Uh, this guy is a real character. And then the, la the other lady in our group said, so tell us more about these pineapples. I said, oh, Elaine, you shouldn't ask anybody about it. I said, we just don't want to encourage them because we've been pestered by beach walkers all, all day. And that's the last thing we want to do is uh, have somebody else and encourage them. And he said, uh, quite simply, madam, $200. So, so suddenly I stood up and took interest. I said, $200? So I said, US dollars? Yeah. He says, um, they $200, real money. I said, what, they're made of gold? He says, they're golden. They're delicious. They're a work of art. They're a real experience. Wait till you've tried it. And I thought, wow. Well, the last thing I was going to be doing was uh, wanting to pay $200 for a pineapple so we just parted company next day he bumped into us and he said uh, I hope you had a good evening uh, let us know when you're ready to try the experience didn't try and sell us anything didn't try and sell us anything so by which time we were enjoying his company laughing a joke he obviously quite a character in Barbados and uh, he said look why don't I uh, come and show you um, my pineapples in a couple of days time so well, we're playing golf uh, in a couple of days so what about, what about three days time so he said, I'll come and find you. Which hotel are you in? So we're in the hotel next door. So he said, we agreed to meet at 11 o'clock. And I thought, okay, here's a guy on the beach selling pineapples for $200. There's something that we're going to learn from. I didn't know what it was, but there was something we were going to learn from this guy. And today is all about the fundamentals of business as this guy. So let's just park it there and move on. And I just want to now take you on to uh, one of my dreams. Because one of the things I love doing in my spare time is I love looking at some old films just to uh, the easy things not intellectually challenging just just something I can watch in the background and uh, one of these great films is Ben-Hur uh, with Charlton Heston now there's uh, Ben-Hur the f famous uh, story of the little boy who had his friend with a Roman soldier and uh, the Roman soldier became a Roman, of uh, became a Roman officer, the little boy that was Roman, uh, his Roman friend, and Ben-Hur became a slave. And he was chucked onto the uh, Roman galleys, and uh, the slaves were rowing away, manacled to the oars. They had a soldier banging the drum, bang, bang, bang. So they were rowing in time to the, to the drum. And the first time I was watching this, and I thought, this is just like a business. This is incredible. So you've got your slaves, your uh, factory workers and office workers, and you've got your managers. They're the soldiers whipping the slaves. You've got the drummer drumming the beat, so they have to uh, manage it all to the right time. And then you've got the owners and the, ma and the chief executives sitting on the deck with a steering wheel, sipping a glass of wine. Oh, this is so like a business. Anyway, what they were doing were rowing away in the middle of the ocean, and then slaves started to die so not a problem there were plenty of slaves left uh, down in the uh, bottom of the boat so as one slave died they unmanacle him chuck him over the side and they bring another slave up until they ran out of slaves so there was i thinking right what would a typical business person do in those circumstances when they ran out of factory workers i know what they do they'd um, get somebody um, from the management to start rowing because we can't let the ship get any slower, can we? So sure enough, they start getting junior management, so from the soldiers' ranks going along until there was only the drummer left. And when the, all the soldiers there and the slaves continue to die, there was another spare oar. So getting slower, what does the business owner do? Does he stay on deck? Or does he get down there and take, a, take an oar? Sure enough, he gets down there, he looks at his direction and he takes an oar, helps the ship to keep rowing faster and faster and faster. And then after a while, he gets up and says, I better check that we're still on direction. Oh, we've gone off direction. So we'll change the uh, direction and we'll try and go um, uh, to a better direction. And does that regularly, eventually just missing the rock gets into port. And so with great relief, they sit down like good business people and they review their project and see how they've done. And they realize that just getting past those rocks, they'd escaped uh, a tragic, uh, tragic end to their journey, but they'd gone into the wrong port. So they called for Super Mike. 
So Super Mike came in to um, help give them some advice. Remember, this is my dream, so I'm allowed to take the star part. So uh, Super Mike comes along and said, tell me the story. And they explained, and I said, ah, you're just making the same mistake that so many businesses do. I said, we need to measure what matters. And you're making the, uh, so, such a common mistake. What you're doing is measuring activity as opposed to concentrating on the results. And this is very relevant with Charlie and her otter. You know, what, what is the outcome? What's the overall intention? What are you trying to achieve? What's the overall direction? So many businesses lose sight of what they're trying to achieve, where their ultimate direction, what they're focused on is the activity and trying to get more efficient and trying to get faster on their activity. So I explained to them, I said, look, this is one of the fundamentals of business. You have to decide what, to make, what you need to measure and only measure what matters. Focus on that and concentrate on it. So I left them that and said, right, let me show you a story. Let me introduce you to a little duck. So your little duck is just like so many businesses. What you have to do if you're in business on purpose, live your life on purpose. Don't live your life by accident. So you have to measure what matters in your business. Now, every business is different, but you've got to have clearly understood goals so you can have a clearly understood uh, mission, but vision. More importantly, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like when you actually get there? Of course, and then if you change, change your vision when you get there, that's fine. But you need to have a direction. So this straight road in Canada, I took this picture because this was perfect for this, uh, what I'm trying to share. You've got one of those mountain peaks at the end. You want to go there? You have to decide by when do you need to get there. And then you have to say, well, why do I want to get there? Um, I want to, uh, if you're happy that that is the goal that you want to achieve, you can then go off direction if, as long as you've got something where along the way you can measure, you can put posts along the side and you can measure your progress. Because if you actually know where you're going, start with the end in mind and work backwards. Too many businesses start from last year and work forwards. Their point of reference is wrong because they're always looking um, at last year. What they need to do is say, right, within the next two years, I need to be at that top of that mountain, whatever that top of that mountain means in your business. And then you can decide, well, if I, I've got three quarters of the way, I can go take a side road off and I can take a, a route and come round the back, whichever way it is, as long as you get there in two years time, you can change your direction as long as the what is clear and actually defines what you're trying to achieve because you're measuring for a starting with the end in mind and you're coming backwards rather than going from where you were last year and moving forwards, which is totally irrelevant, but is the mistake that so many businesses make. So I always challenge and say, right, look, strategic planning is quite simple. You measure your what, you ask yourself why, and only then get into the how. So most businesses, too many businesses get stuck in the how. I remember one board meeting I was uh, chairing and one of the directors says, can we just stop talking and get stuck in? And I said, but we haven't actually defined what we're trying to achieve. And he looked at me really strangely and it just didn't register. And I thought this just typifies so many businesses. So you have to define your what, be totally clear about your what, and then ask why. That's why non-exec directors are quite good. Why, why is that your goal? Is that enough? Is it too risky? So make sure your why is justified. So if you're happy, only then work out how you're going to achieve it. And how is simply who, where, and when. Who's going to help you do it? Where are you going to do it? And when are you going to do it in all your panel chunks? So you've got to stick milestones along your way to make sure that you measure what matters to you. Now, in this little session together, we're going to talk about financial measures, but we're also going to talk about non-financial measures that uh, don't come with bits of software. So what I want you to do is just, as we're talking about, is just think about your business and think about our little duck who's gone to the end of the road and ends up on the river Zambezi, what I call the Zambezi factor. So this little duck um, has no brakes, has no steering wheel, has no sails. So the only way it has any direction is by, by reacting to the currents and the winds of life what I call an adre business, business adrenaline surfer. So they end up attending uh, the river and they say, right, okay, where's the current taking me? Well, I can't uh, influence where it's gonna take me because I'm just gonna go with the flow and I'm gonna react accordingly. And that's what I see so many businesses doing. Instead of planning and understanding where they're going and making sure that they've got plans to make sure they're safe. 
And if they're lucky, that little duck can end up in calmer waters. Um, but it's just pure luck because they've got no oars, they've got no rudders, and they've got no ways of breaking themselves or using sails to give them some sort of direction. The trouble is, although you can be very calm just here, this is a true picture that of uh, the River Zambezi, and you'll see to the left, the water starts getting white. And what does that mean? That means danger. That means faster water. And it means you're even more out of control. But it also means in business, heavier loans, smarter cars, probably more people employed, more risks you're taking. But hey, what fun, what great exhilaration. But you're totally out of control. And the trouble is, if you go too far, you get into the real white water, which means that the river Zambezi goes over Victoria Falls. I was brought up in Africa, so it was a real pleasure for me to be able to go and visit Victoria Falls and take the picture. And the trouble is, that poor old business signified by the duck, if it goes too fast and takes too many risks and has too much white water and doesn't measure what matters, goes over Victoria Falls and unless they're really lucky, will perish. Unless Super Mike's on the other side to rescue it. So not everybody can uh, depend on Super Mike to be, to be there to rescue. So we need to focus on what matters in our business. So we need to think in terms of what are the issues that are relevant to our business. So let's go back to the real issues. So if I say to you, right, what are the key results that you would measure? Where are you going to put your milestones along that straight road in terms of starting with the end in mind? Now, what I'm normally told is my cash reserves, my sales figures, uh, my profit. All these are correct, but it just depends what's relevant to you. If it depends where, what you're starting from, what you're trying to achieve. And so what I want to do is just go over. So if we were to, for example, talking about sales, let's actually look at sales in slightly more detail. Too many people will measure sales. What I want to know is, and it's slightly relevant after our LinkedIn sessions uh, last week with Charlie, I want to know the sales broken down by the number of customers. I want to know what the sales are broken down by how successful we are being with our lead generation, how successful we are with our lead conversion. So we heard Charlie talking about sales funnels. Well, there's a sales funnel, but more just as important is our defection. How good are we at keeping our customers once we've actually got them there? Then we've also got how often they buy and how much they spend with us, which is a factor of how much we're charging and the quantity they buy. So when I look at sales and uh, look at the analysis in business, I'm looking with a really successful business at the moment and their margins are just so unpredictable. And I, I said, look, let's get down and dirty with your figures. And I suddenly realized they were not measuring their relevant costs against their relevant income. They hadn't got a clue. They were just taking an overall picture. They now suddenly realized they're undercharging like mad. But because they were taking so many deposits in advance that they were calling sales, that their figures were looking better than they really were. So I've now gotten break them down, break down your numbers. So don't ever look at sales just in total absolute figures. Turn them into ratios if you can, but turn them into um, the number of customers, how good you are at generating those customers, um, how good you are at uh, converting those customers, and how good you are at keeping them. These are really important, especially as we come out of the pandemic. What about costs? What about cash? So people will look at that and say, well, we'll try and minimize. And I say, yeah, but how do you do it? What's the best way? And so what I try and do is explain. Let's look at uh, costs as variable costs, which uh, some people will call direct costs. In other words, they're directly variable in proportion to the sales you make. So they're the cost of your sales, the direct cost of your sales, so the quantity purchase times the unit costs of the goods sold. You then measure your other costs, which are influenced by your sales. So what I call activity costs. So look at your activities or transactions um, and unit costs of activity. So that could be marketing. It could be um, telephone costs. It could be motor expenses. Um, it could be entertaining. Things that are influenced by your sales activity. And finally, you've got to look at your fixed costs. It is astonishing how many businesses are totally unaware of the different types of costs. You need to understand it in order to be able to work out your break-even analysis. You need to know 
what costs you're going to be incurring whether you make a sale or not. So we need to be able to uh, distinguish what our fixed costs are in our business compared to those that are directly variable in the proportion to our sales. And that way we'll be able to actually understand our margins uh, better. But we need to go to that trouble and make sure that our traditional figures that are being produced by software give us this basic analysis. So if you turn into ratios, that allows you to look at uh, the trends, the trends compared to uh, the previous quarter, the previous year, the trends compared to your competition. So some, uh, some businesses will have uh, industry type ratios, but it could be just looking at overheads per head, overheads per hour, overheads per square foot, marketing cost per sales. There's so many different ratios, but I always say don't look at absolutes because looking at absolutes mean nothing because um, an absolute to you is going to be completely different to an absolute in another business. So look at um, the ratios that are relevant to you and the relevant to the type of business you're running. It's common sense, I know, but so many businesses do not use common sense. They do not measure these ratios. It really is important. And if you start with the end in mind, you will know what ratios you need to measure. But what about non-financial drivers? What sort of um, measures would you ma measure? What matters would you measure that are non-financial? Let me give you an old example. Let me ask you just to think in your head. If you were an owner of an airline business, what are the three most important measures that you would want to uh, be looking after and I'll accept safety as a number one. Three, apart from safety, the airline industry, luckily, is an extremely safe industry. So we, we wouldn't go on the planes if, there was, if we thought there was a, any remote chance of us not uh, getting there. But there's three other fundamental drivers that uh, you would measure, and they're still very relevant. So I'm going to introduce you to a book by Gordon Bethune, who joined from Boeing uh, Continental Airlines. And what he did was he wrote a book uh, called Worst to First. I'll come back to uh, I'll come back to the uh, profit robbers, um, the Continental Airlines. Worst to First, and he he wrote this book behind the scenes of Continental's remarkable comeback. If you were a owner of an airline, what would you be measuring? Just think about it in your head. Uh, what are the what are the angles that you would be um, measuring? Turnaround time at the airport, yeah. Um, bit more fundamental than that. On time arrival. So turnaround time, yes, Stephen, that's fine, but it's that's, that's an internal thing, but from a customer's point of view, we just wanna know we're gonna arrive on time. We wanna know that our luggage is on the same plane. And we wanna know that uh, we've got nothing to complain about. So all the issues that we want to measure. So these were the three measures and Gordon Batoon in writing his book explained that by looking after this, everything else came right. These were his leading indicators, which I'll refer to shortly. And these were his leading indicators that he measured and he turned around from the worst performing airline in the United States to the best performing airline. So, uh, I use that as an example. Now, I just want to take you back to um, our profit robbers. Profit robbers are other examples of uh, non-financial drivers, but examples of waste. So think about your business. I think um, advertising, quite honestly, um, can be a massive waste of money if you haven't got the fundamentals right in your business. Um, Marketing can be, um, is so essential, but if done badly, um, it's such an amazing waste of money. And it's not because 50%, uh, you know, you don't know which 50% is working, it's because it's done so badly. So that's why I was fascinated by uh, the talks uh, last week and uh, looking at how we can use LinkedIn more effectively. Poor communication, poor selling skills, poor guarantees. Charlie was asking me before time, what's mad? Uh, because I have a, a page called Be Mad, Not Sad. Don't be satisfactory and dull like so many other businesses. Be magnificent and dazzling. So what happens is if you're magnificent and dazzling, you get uh, recommendations from other businesses. So actually think in terms of um, what are the things that matter? What are the examples of waste in your business? 
What is your uh, AAA service again? We haven't, haven't got time to cover. That's another um, one of my talks on why on earth I should buy from you when we're looking at uh, people who are sad rather than mad and who do not offer AAA service. They offer single A service. So poor sickness policy is a good one. How many businesses encourage people to be ill? They pay them to be ill when uh, they don't pay the people who are never ill anymore. So uh, then there's the training. So these are just examples. What I want to do is register them in your head to think, do these matter to you? What are the non-financial things, which are examples of waste, which I call profit robbers in a business? It might be you've got none, fantastic. So you, if in that case, you don't have to worry about it. But everybody is going to be have a question about their service. What is your service package? that is actually going to be relevant in terms of uh, getting your business to be more effective. So Charlie, miserable mackerels. Uh, miserable mackerels are, is that person who answers your phone or answers an email that's got out of bed at the wrong time. Now, any of you seen that uh, old fish uh, programs, um, Pike Place Market in Seattle, in Washington state. Um, and they've got these people who are holding and handling frozen fish. And I remember the, the, um, the video of this guy said, you know, I'm a 25 year old young buck and uh, I was out late last night and I had to choose my attitude. I had to choose whether I was gonna come in and be happy. Or I was gonna choose whether I was gonna be miserable. And so many of our team choose to be miserable and infect the rest of us. And that's one of the biggest profit robbers in businesses where you've got people chewing their bottom lip, being miserable mackerels. And unfortunately, sometimes they're answering the phone and you never know if that's going to be your most um, profitable prospect that you've ever had is going to be answered by a miserable mackerel on the end of your phone. So they could be a massive profit robber. Right. So hopefully I've just parked that idea into your head. So Continental measured on time arrival, lost luggage and customer complaints. So other examples I give you to think about innovation. We are faced with an amazing a tsunami of change now with artificial intelligence, robotics. We're all going to be affected by it. The software is going to do so much of our work, but we still need to interpret what the information um, that is going to be provided. So we need to invest in our knowledge, in our training and our systems. Our systems are really important. So many businesses are OXO businesses, not XOX businesses. If I can explain that, this is, uh, I not didn't invent this, uh, I can't remember who invented this term, but uh, OXO businesses are people who have got ordinary systems, they've got extraordinary people, and yet they only get ordinary results. So what you want to be is an XOX business where you've got extraordinary systems, you only need to employ ordinary people, in other words, less expensive people, but you still get extraordinary results. So obviously anybody that's franchised McDonald's, um, pizza, um, what's the, uh, the pizza place, every, pretty well every franchise owner um, of that pizza delivery company is a millionaire, highly systematic. Um, so a lot of the food franchises are well, um, and they are very, got fantastic systems that they um, hand out. You've got to make sure that you look at your business and say, what can I do? How much does it depend on me? How much does it depend on my systems? And finally, what I think is the most important one, it's moments of truth. Again, based on an old book, but I still love it. It's still relevant. I haven't found anybody who has explained it better. Jan Carlson, who uh, turned around another airline called Scandinavian Airlines, SAS, and he wrote his book about moments of truth. And he said, every moment of interaction with my customer is a moment of truth. So this is an old book, but he said, he's the one who talked about when somebody comes on my plane, when they pull down their meal tray, if there's a coffee stain on my meal tray, gosh, what does that say about the state of my engines? Totally irrelevant. There's no, no correlation to the engineers who are cleaning the engines compared to the cleaning team who are cleaning the inside of the plane. But psychology in your passenger's head might say, hmm, if they can't be bothered to take the coffee, uh, clean the coffee off our meal trays, what the state of the engines? I had an interesting um, episode at Faro Airport when I got onto EasyJet. I pulled down my meal tray and there was a coffee stain on there, two coffee stains on there. Now, luckily, EasyJet has got a really good safety record, but it just made me think, having read the book, 
And I thought, well, I'll just take the picture to illustrate the point. Because if I can't be bothered to do the small things, where do they draw the line about what's small and what's big? In order to try and cut costs, where do they draw the line about the important things that need to be measured? So these are the areas. I compared that to a previous trip when I was working in Iran and they didn't even, on this plane, I was working in an island called Quiche Island and I was on Quiche Air. Um, they couldn't even, uh, didn't even have a meal tray. Their planes were so old that the, uh, the meal tray there, and I had to sort of um, have my uh, refreshments actually on my lap using a briefcase. Even worse, I mean, at that stage, it just made me think about uh, the, this whole study uh, by Jan Carlson. I looked to my left, found the emergency exit had already been uh, utilised in a previous time. I think it was an old Bulgarian airline, but it certainly made you think. And so the moment of truth there is just breathe in and pray. And so I've never been so nervous on my trip back to Tehran from Quiche Island when I was travelling on this plane. Um, I've had a few hairy uh, plane trips in Iran, but uh, this is, it's just un engaging the psychology in terms of me as a customer. Would I ever go back on Quiche Island there? Not a chance. Even if they've got modern thing, uh, modern planes now, I wouldn't go back. The psychology is their management, of course their management I might have changed, but the management didn't care enough or they were interested in, in saving costs. Okay, so let me just go back to the concept of leading indicators and lagging indicators. So I'm a member of a group called AVN and uh, we had a, introduced to us a thing called One Page Plan, which is based around the um, Kaplan uh, methodology. And so what you do is rather than having just your profit and loss account, what you do is you identify your vision and then you identify your underlying success drivers. So your underlying success driver, what is it that if it's really important to your business, what is it that you need to measure? Let me give you an example. I was working with um, a business that uh, sold pallets, pallets, you know, for the delivery goods. Now their, their pallets, uh, some of them were plastic, some of them were just plain wood pallets. And I said to them, guys, you are, you're expanding, you're becoming bigger and bigger. What is it that is fundamental to your success? And they said, our turnaround time. So I said, okay, so what is your turnaround time? And they said, it's pretty quick. And I said, well, um, how quick? And they said, well, I don't know. So their underlying success driver was their turnaround time, yet they weren't measuring it because it didn't, it didn't appear in their software, yet it was most important. So I said, so if you're not here as directors, would your team know whether they're doing well or not? Have you not got a system about measuring what's most important in terms of your underlying success driver? So I think this is the point that I'm trying to share with you. What is it that matters that really is fundamental? Because even if it's a non-financial thing, you should be measuring it. So you put down your underlying success driver next, going upwards rather than downwards. As a traditional profit and loss, you have your sales, cost of sales, your overheads, and you get to your profit. Here we're working upwards. So our core vision and purpose underpins everything. We identify what is fundamental in terms of underlying success. Measure that then start measuring our sales drivers, like I explained to you, then measure our costs in the way I talked about it. And only at the end do we actually get the key results. And when I'm looking at that, look at the difference between a leading indicator and a lagging indicator. A leading indicator is something that you can influence future results. A lagging indicator, those key results, you can't do anything with, they've happened. They are a factor of what happened six months ago. So if your underlying success driver maybe is customer care and your customer care was slipping or your client, your turnaround turn rate in terms of what you're delivering was slipping, that will reflect in lower sales in six months time. You can't do anything about those results. You, what you can do is influence your leading indicators. So my challenge to you is think about what are your leading indicators that you have a chance to do, deal with now that have a chance to influence your sales and your results um, in the next six months time. So differentiate between what you can influence and what you can't influence. Measure what matters. So here's an example. So my firm of accountants is called X5 Accountants. And here's just an example of, in this case, the underlying success driver was customer delight. So this is an anonymized client. Um, they've got uh, their sales drivers prospect appointments values of new clients, special work, and this was done quarterly. And they measure, they measure their um, information quarterly, and they could change it in the following quarter. 
It's a really simple thing. All the results and the profit and loss, that's all behind the scenes. So you still get all that information. But this is measuring what matters, identifying what it is. So you see at the bottom here, customer happiness is back on track. Score of questionnaire. The target in green was 4.5. Actual was 4.5. Customer happiness is back on track. So the other one was uh, the, on terms of customer like we must make more time to satisfy our customers. So these are the things, that just something that's really good. Back here, you see, investigate um, our cash last month's actual. Our target was 4,000. Um, we um, were worse off 13,295. Investigate why credit control is so poor and implement new systems. So have a look at your business and think about what matters. So before we come to a conclusion, I just want to ask you simply, what are the biggest costs in most businesses? So you can use your chat, come up with some ideas. What are the biggest costs in most businesses? I don't know whether they are in yours, but again, across the world, I find that this is the biggest cost I come across and it's very rarely measured. Charlie, your time, yeah, time, yeah, that's uh, a cost, but even more expensive than that. Okay, we've got, a we've got a shy group. Right, let me explain then. Health, Charlie, yes, health, employee systems, Reem said yes, employees. Um, normally I'm, I'm told wages or rent, property costs, for example, like that. They're quite common, but this is more fundamental, more basic. And let me, let me show you, you'll, you'll look at it and you'll say, ah, okay. This is a typical trading account. Um, the figures are meaningless. Let's just say sales, 2 million, cost of sales, 1.95, leaving a profit of 50. But what it's not showing me is what the sale should have been. The sales should have been 3 million, but they discounted their sale prices by a third and they were giving away discounts of a million pounds to actually get 2 million. So in my experience, in so many businesses, and it's really relevant at the moment because I am seeing it going ballistic at the moment as they, people are competing with the IT world, are competing with the Amazons of this world, they are making the mistake of cutting their risks and become, allowing themselves to become commodities. You cannot afford to make that mistake. Those of you who are on Charlie's uh, talks last uh, week, you would hear that how we have to be able to differentiate. We have to make sure that our LinkedIn pages make us somebody that they're interested, so they're curious about, that they want to actually know more because people like to do, deal with people they like. Nobody wants to pay any more than they need to, but price is not the main factor in any relationship unless you allow it to be. And I am seeing more and more businesses of all sorts, professionals, um, as well as um, manufacturers, as well as retail, making the big mistake of reacting to the Amazons of this world and the artificial intelligence and all the software systems out there by cutting their prices. You can't do that. You should never, ever give a discount. Never, ever give a discount. Now, people will argue till they're blue in their face with me about that. By all means, give a special price. Never, ever give a discount. A discount is a swear word that you should never, ever use because if you ever give a discount, you are going to have to give another one because that person who got the discount will ask you for their usual discount. If you can give a discount once, you'll always be able to give a discount. So please... Have a look at this chart I'm just going to show you. So many salespeople haven't seen this. This in, in my book, I've got, I use this gross profit percentage. The bank, uh, banks have seen it. When I went to Durham Business School, um, this was the first time I saw this. A typical business has a gross profit margin of 30%. Now, at the moment, I'm seeing anything from 5% to 15% or more discounts being applied. If you have got a 30% gross profit margin on your business, and you look to reduce your price by 5%, your sales must increase by 20% to be no worse off. If you were to do it by 10%, your sales must increase by 50% to be no worse off if you've got a 30% gross profit margin. If you were to do 15%, you've got to double your sales. 
So imagine you're going to give a 15% discount and your sales are need to double. Yeah, no way is it going to happen. Now, I had one case where somebody has said to me, I've gone on a sale and I'm giving a 15% discount. I've got a 30% budget. You know, my sales will double in that period. I said, that's great. But you're going to ruin your business because you're going to ruin your brand and your credibility. What if you put your prices up by 5% instead of taking your prices down? Your sales can reduce by 14% and you'd be no worse off. So if you were to put your price up by 5%, really? Are there your customers going to actually reduce your sales by um, 14%? I wouldn't have thought so. It's unlikely. So it really, really is important to understand that discounts are a swear word that you should never do. By, always, uh, by all means, give a special price. Charlie says, I spoke to a client last week, all their best clients that never leave them get a discount for being a great client. They never put their prices up as they grow each year. That, to me, is really dangerous. Um, they should never, ever get a discount, get a special price in terms of call it a loyalty price, a loyalty reward, but never a discount. It's you, talking in terms of psychology, it's really important because once you get known for being, giving a discount, it's really dangerous. And it's, um, I've, you can you imagine working in the Middle East, working in Africa, they just said that the whole life revolves around discounts. And I said, only because you're allowed. Because I, working in those countries, I can actually see people who never give a discount. They make far more money. And, but what they do is they've actually tailored their package to allow them to give special prices occasionally to reward people that need to be rewarded. So it's really important just to put that into your head and think about it. So when we're talking about lagging and leading indicators, discounts are some of the worst costs that you could ever have. So... Let's take you back to our friend. So on the beach, um, we went off and played golf. And three days later, sure enough, he came along to our um, hotel next door and he found us. And out of his bag, he produced the pineapple. And with great ceremony, he gets out his knife out of a leather sheath and starts peeling this pineapple. Now, Stephen says he's been on there and seen it, um, but he starts singing away. So he starts singing away, pineapples are great for your chest and they help you to digest. And I'm a poet and I'm having fun, neither being in, in the sun. And all sorts, just rubbish, absolute rubbish, but a real character, really enjoying himself. It's the, uh, um, the way that uh, he managed to sell. And so he starts peeling this pineapple until he again gets to the next phase, He's got the hot pineapple peeled apart from these uh, brown nodules, which he then peels away with his sharp knife. He's never touching the flesh. So he peels away, gets, creates little channels, and then reaches into his bag and gets one, a clean freezer bag out of his bag, grabs hold of the bottom of the pineapple, puts the fleshy bit in the pineapple, and then with a flourish, takes the feathers off. And so presents us with uh, a pineapple uh, six slices down and he says great with Barbados rum the best rum in all the world he then sits down to much applause because as people have been watching him perform he's had a crowd gather around him and he sits down there and I suddenly thought Michael what have you forgotten in in being allowing him to demonstrate um, his uh, service and his experience I've forgotten to pin him down to a price I said, original, that was absolutely fantastic. What do I owe you? He said, oh, Mike, he said, I've come to think of you as a friend. He says, let's call it 100. I said, great. Original, I've come to think of you as a friend. Let's call it 20. And I gave him a $20 note. He leant across, took it with a glint in his eye. He said, Mike, it's been great doing business with you. And I thought to myself, have I been had? Now, when I'm speaking at uh, conferences and ask that question, the ladies in the audience say, no, of course you're not. The men say, yeah, you've just paid $20 for a pineapple. But I willingly paid $20 for a pineapple. So my question to you, have I been had? Just think about what happened. This guy never once tried to sell to us. He actually invited us to buy from him, but never once tried to sell to us. He befriended us. He made it such that we quite enjoyed talking to him on the beach, unlike the other um, beach sellers who we actively looked to avoid. And so... He made it a real experience. So when it came to demonstrate his experience, 
I actually was not that phased about the price until I actually sat down and thought, God, I haven't actually pinned him down. And I willingly gave him $20. I've been back to see him a couple of years ago. And I said to him, original, do you ever get $100? He said, yeah. I said, what, from Americans? He said, yeah. I said, what about British? No, no, he says, you're far too tight. So uh, I went and saw him and he was in his Middlesbrough football shirt that the chairman of Middlesbrough, who goes to uh, Sandy Lane Hotel, had bought him, gave him his personalised uh, pineapple man football shirt from Middlesbrough and he's got his pineapple glasses and he's still selling um, his pineapples for $200 or $20 or $100 and is doing very nicely out of it. Just imagine the margins. Now, he doesn't have to do any marketing. People like me talk about him the world around and people come from far and wide to, to experience the pineapple man. What can you do in your business like this pineapple man to make working with you an experience so that you do not have to spend any money marketing because your customers will do your marketing for you? They will talk, talk about you. Just think about those costs, those marketing costs. When I talked to you about typical um, profit robber, to my mind, is marketing costs uh, because marketing is often done so badly that uh, that money is wasted. So that was my challenge to you is to think, what can you do like the pineapple man? So let's think about um, what we've uh, covered today. So I've introduced you to um, our friend here, the pineapple man, who makes working with an experience, um, with him an experience that people will talk about worldwide about. I've introduced you to Ben Hur, where the business focus on activity, not the end result. They don't start with the end in mind. And I've asked you to measure what matters. Set your goal and identify so you can start with the end in mind and work backwards. Identify really what is, what is important and looking at your costs, make sure that you are totally aware of the costs that matter to you in terms of the fixed costs and the costs that are directly variable. And whatever you do, try and make sure you retain that margin. Whatever you do, look at your profit robbers and look at your underlying success driver. Make sure that whatever it is that's fundamental to your success is measured, even if it's non-financial. And make sure if it's a leading indicator, even more important that it's measured more importantly than a lagging indicator. And last but not least, Neil says, we take away services if a client asks for a discount. It's the only way we reduce fees. Absolutely. So you never actually give a discount. You just say, uh, that's my price. What do I, uh, um, what service do you not want? if you want to, uh, want to have it for a lower price. The only way to fundamentally do it, or you actually have, uh, you look at your package, you look at your service wrapper and make sure it is such that allows you some flexibility to get a special price where if I can do that for you, what can you do for me? So you make that as part of your, your negotiation strategy. So if I can leave you with that thought that you always, always never ever give a discount. So that's, and I'm just seeing it now as we emerge because of the competition with people um, using uh, software like the Amazons, B businesses are gonna go bust. You might as well slit your wrist now and make it a quick release rather than die a painful death. Because if you go down that route and make your, allow yourself to be a commodity, you're gonna cause yourself a problem. So I hope in that brief run through, I've given you the getting down and dirty about the nuggets of profit that are relevant to us all um, in business, including myself as an accountant. As I explained to Charlie, I just had, even though I'm on holiday this week, I've just had a, a classic nonsense from one of my co-directors. And it, it's so important that we uh, focus on uh, what matters in our business. And I hope I've been able to share that with you. If you've got any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Um, and I'll come off uh, sharing the uh, screen and uh, answer any questions that you have. That was brilliant. I like the story about the pineapple man because I've not um, heard that or seen that, um, but have experienced similar things from people that just sell it for what you think people are going to buy. It goes on to that assumption thing, doesn't it, as well? It's like if you assume you make an ass out of you and me, it's like a lot of people assume that you've got to charge a low fee. I know I made that mistake when I first went into business and you, if you sell for a low fee people are going to pay it some people won't pay it because they think it's too cheap as well right uh, yeah great great things also good to hear that the otter made an appearance as well it's my goal <laughs> my goal in life at the moment is to get everybody talking about otters <laughs> 
Um, has anybody got any questions? I think everybody's probably. Right. I, I, yeah, I tried. I tried to make it non-accounting as uh, as I could. Non-accounting. So. It's good. How, so, just out of interest, like, how do you measure? Do you use um, a good old old-fashioned spreadsheet, or do you have a software or a system, or like, how do you measure? No, we just have a good old-fashioned spreadsheet. So, if we're um, so, for example, at the moment we're trying out a new uh, team. Uh, so, one of the things is team engagement. So, we're we're just trying out a system called Engagement Multiplier. So, again, something in the cloud, and uh, seeing whether we can uh, measure. How our team engagement is because you know if you've got a dissatisfied or unhappy team you're going to end up having unhappy customers so it's, it's measuring those things and then we um, also are looking at uh, trying to make make it more automatic in terms of measuring client satisfaction um, and trying to we've got a trying to use a system rather than survey monkey um, so that uh, we can engage there but just measuring the trends and uh, getting getting a feel for it brilliant yeah, the last company I worked for, we used to do MPS, um, uh, Net Promoter Score, uh, yes. uh, surveying. But like the questions were so broad and the data, it was just like, you're wasting a load of time collecting this data because we can't actually do anything with it. It doesn't tell us anything useful. Um, but they, it was a key, key measurement. Yes. Um, so they've since changed that, which is a good thing. But uh, yeah, sometimes like, you can get too hung up with what you measure before actually that's why like they are in the the otter is all about reviewing and reflecting so yeah. you know like have a look at the measurements are they still relevant because something that may have been relevant when you first got started with this might not be relevant now um, so it's good to have a look at those things yes yeah, Stephen says do you measure something slightly different every month or is it stable for the year do you know i i'll do it for a quarter um but I, if if everything's going well and there's something else i would i could happily introduce um to measure it it depends whether it's really important, if it's fundamental, so an underlying success, I'd measure it for uh, permanently. But if you then work, say, for example, your cash collection is slipping, I'd work on that for a quarter. And if it comes right, then I'd, I'd go and focus on something else. It's, it's, it's what's relevant to you. So that one page plan idea just allows you to, rather than getting sidetracked and looking at a whole load of information that people get uh, blinded by figures, what you want to do is actually focus on the issues that are really relevant to your business. Cash flow clearly is a really important one, especially in today's climate with um, the bankers are telling me that so many businesses have not applied for loans. Uh, what they've done is they've applied for loans and they're hoping it will be enough. What they haven't done is actually put enough thinking into um, how they're justifying the figures they've got. They haven't done enough what if testing about the future. So they're just stuck in there taking a bounce back loan or taking a C-bills loan and hope that it's sufficient to meet the, not because there's any, any other back, background science to it. So the bankers are calling it the Halloween horror show, just about to happen. Oh really? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> On that pessimistic, miserable note. Yeah. <laughs> no, very pessimistic indeed. That's why Trello is really useful because I think um, uh, for everybody that watched the last um, objective, um, workshop earlier this month as well i shared a trello template as well for your marketing um because your marketing will come into that so you know if you're looking at um customer retention so you were talking about conversion rate numbers and um leads and how much you're spending on your marketing it's like actually is that working for you do you need to spend that much money on marketing do you need to increase the budget and if so in what department um, because a lot of people just think, right, I need more leads. And it's just like, well, do you need more leads or do you need to get better at converting the leads that you're getting? Um, yeah. and put, your, put your marketing budget where, where it's needed the most. But you need to measure these things in order to know where you're going to put your marketing budget. Yes. Reem's asked about AAA service. And that, um, that's quite simple. I, when I do this uh, different sort of presentation called Why on Earth Should I Buy From You? What's so special about you? Um, AAA service is uh, uh, three types of service. Uh, most most people um, give one of them uh, in terms of there's a single A, which is awful. There's double A, which is average. There's triple A, which is amazing. And uh, which one do people never talk about? Most people will talk about something that's awful. And they'll say, I went to this new restaurant last night and the service was absolutely appalling. So you'll tell, you'll tell sort of 20 people, 
whatever you do, don't go there. If it's amazing, you'll probably tell 10 people. So I went to this new restaurant last night. The service was amazing. It was fantastic. They uh, really made me feel special. But what do most of us give is double A average. What does nobody ever talk about is the double A average business, satisfactory and dull. So my challenge to businesses is to change yourself from a single A to a triple A um, type of service because just like the pineapple man, you get people talking about you and doing your marketing for you. And funny enough, you can charge more because what they want to do is deal with people they like dealing with, not because they're dealing with something because it's cheaper. Same applies for your suppliers as well. If you can deliver a triple A service to your suppliers as a customer as well, um, just that observation as well can make a big difference, especially if some of your suppliers are well connected and talk to other people that could potentially be your clients. Yeah. Um, is another one. I love that because I was it. I worked with a consultant for quite a few quite a few years ago, and I was saying, all right, well, we were talking about what made the company that I worked for at the time different, and it was like, well, we offer great customer service. So he was just like, well, what do you mean by great customer service? Because what do people expect in terms of? Um, so if you're looking at AAA and you're looking at average, what do people expect? Back down to the expectation thing, what do people expect in terms of customer service? What's their baseline? So if you're going to deliver great customer service, how can you elevate that baseline? Or are you delivering their baseline anyway? Because sometimes what you consider great is what they consider average. Or, yeah. you know, what you it's consider okay. average is what they consider great sometimes. I mean, Dartmouth, I'm, I'm staying at Airbnb because it's really convenient. It's just, just up above the port. And um, it's, uh, they've really gone to town. They've got a, a whole uh, basket full of goodies. They had their um, bottle of bub bubbles, but it's just a little small things like uh, on our towels, you know, there's both of us have got a little duck there. Um, there's also, also little touches. They think, well, this is totally unnecessary, but it's those small things that we talk about. So the hotel I stayed with down in uh, Studland Bay had um, welly boots for, if it gets uh, wet, there's welly boots of every size. If somebody wants to go for a walk and it's muddy, borrow one of our welly boots. It's just, you know, it just doesn't cost much to uh, have those little small things that make a massive difference in people's lives. And then they get to talk about it. Yeah, great talking points at every moment. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, quick request as well. Could we get a copy of the slides? Um, and then I can include those with the Definitely. recording because I think that'll be useful for everybody. And also cheeky request as well, your template for the one page um, measurement thing. Do you have that as a separate PDF or? Yes. Right. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll send that to you as a separate PDF. Brilliant, because I know what everybody will be asking. So we'll include that and then the, the replay will be available. And also, if you have a question for Mike at any point as well, um, just tag him in. Um, the way that Mighty Networks works is that if you just at mention Mike, then he'll be notified and you can ask questions and things like that as well. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for doing this. I very much appreciated, especially during your holiday. And um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Good to see you all. Brilliant. Okay. Until next time, look out for an email from me later today about what's going on on Friday. And um, yeah, we'll see you all soon. Bye for now. Brilliant. Bye, everyone. Bye.